I'm Michael. And I'm Landon. And this is In Their 20s, the best podcast for people in their 20s. We had someone very special on our show today. We spoke with the most powerful woman in banking, Kathy Bassant, who currently serves as the Chief Operations and Technology Officer at Bank of America, a company where she oversees 95,000 employees between 35 different countries and has a budget of $14 billion. She's very influential and she embodies starting from the bottom. She began her career on the credit training floor and worked her way up to the top, working in so many different positions, including serving as the Chief Marketing Officer at one point. We love this interview so much because it's not just for students and young professionals in the financial services industry. This interview is so broad, it's for everybody, any student trying to do amazing things or any young professionals trying to stand out in the workplace. We loved how authentic and fun our conversation with Kathy was, and she is a big Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan, so it was no surprise to see her rock her Tampa Bay Buccaneers hat throughout the interview. Before we dive into this interview, make sure you're subscribed to us on YouTube. As a reminder, we are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, so go ahead and follow us there as well. Awesome. Let's jump in with Kathy. So we feel the best place to begin with our interview is the beginning. Um, you did attend the Ross School of Business in Michigan, uh, where you did take many, many classes that helped develop you into the amazing banking professional you are today. Uh, we'd love to hear about your favorite class during this time and also favorite professor and what makes them your favorite professor. Well, you know, I did take a lot of classes at Michigan, um, not all of them in the Ross School. When I started out at Michigan, I, my plan was to be an English major and to go to law school. And um, my father informed me that he wasn't paying for law school. So I decided I needed to do something uh, before I went to law school to help, help earn money. So applied to Ross. In those days, you got into Ross after your sophomore year. So applied to Ross and spent two years in the Ross School of Business. I tell everybody all the time that my favorite classes and the classes that I use most every single day um, are statistics and operations management. You know, all you calculus nuts, I don't really, I, I, I don't want to diss you in any way, but I've never once had to calculate anything that related to sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, um, never had to calculate Black-Scholes model uh, results on my own, but statistics and understanding them, I have to deal with every single day. And it helps me to have had those classes every single day. So it won't surprise you um, that my Three favorite teachers, Russell, Russell Frazier, who taught Shakespeare um, and wrote the book that we used in class. Um, uh, Professor Cliff Ball, who was my statistics teacher um, at Michigan. And, um, and then also um, a professor named Harbir Singh. And um, Professor Singh, who's now at the Wharton School, taught operations management. And I found the whole analysis, honestly, I found the whole analysis of process work end to end around quality in output being determined at every step of the way. I found it fascinating and I use it every single day. Love that. I know a lot of times, um, you know, people young in their careers, uh, they're curious, you know, the stuff that I learned in the classroom, will I use this uh, later on in my career? So to hear you say that, yes, you do use these skills that you gain in the classroom to this day, um, and they've helped make you into the you know, best banking professional you can be is really, really amazing to hear. And on the subject of Ross, uh, we do understand that uh, some time ago, you and a group of alumni had an opportunity to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, we'd love to hear about you know, how that came to be um, and you know, your, your experiences on that amazing, amazing journey. Well, I did with two other alumni and the Dean and the Director of um, Executive Education. So the five of us adults, um, guides and, um, and a team of support people and 30 Ross students, 30 undergraduate Ross students um, went to Mount Kilimanjaro in August of 2018. So uh, over two years now, which is hard to believe. It's funny today I was uh, doing my cycling workout 15.27 miles today, um, average speed of 10.4 miles per hour, impressed. But the, t the, the tape that I was listening to, the, 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 um, the playlist was my playlist from Kilimanjaro. And so I think about that experience all the time. And, and I will tell you what it took. It took um, being fierce. It took not giving up. It took an immense amount of, of preparation, just an immense amount of, of prep. 
And it took building relationships with the 35, 37 of us uh, that were the climbers and with uh, the support team. Uh, because we might not have all been climbing together every single moment of every day, but the support structure and the uh, shared energy was a huge reason for all of our, our successes. Um, it was a, it's probably one of the peak experiences of my life, but let me just say this, I am one and done. I am not a mountain climber. I don't like edges. Anyone who tells you Kilimanjaro is a trek and not a climb, is misleading you greatly. So um, I loved it, thrilled to do it with, with my family, um, my extended family at Ross and, and happy to have done it. Great to see that you conquered your fears though of doing that. Um, you know, that does take a lot of uh, preparation, um, but great to see that it was an amazing journey. People ask me all the time, how were the views? And I say this, my primary view was the boots of the person in front of me, because you can't, if you if you see the edge and you have a fear of edges, you can't get over it. If you just and a lot of things in life are like uh, in life are like this. If you just put one foot in front of the other, keep moving, keep making progress, um, uh, it comes together. Wow, yeah, no, Kathy, that is truly amazing. <laughs> there was just so many people around you, and the fact that you went through that experience was it was truly amazing. Um, and now. You know, you go through this experience with Bank of America for over 30 years. That's <laughs> right, right there. That's right. It's amazing, too. Um, what made you want to stay with a bank like Bank of America over the course of your career? Well, I never intended to. As I said in the beginning of our discussion, I intended to work for two or three years and then go back to law school. So nobody was more surprised or nobody is more surprised than me to find myself here um, all the way in one company, all the way since 1982. Um, I think a couple of things were important. First, early on, I loved, immediately loved taking business problems or taking client problems and figuring out the right solution. I loved that whole concept of applying both brain power and skill sets to customer needs and then, and then helping them. So I loved what we did. The second thing is, is I loved the cycle of go to work, do a, a project, get feedback, get paid, get promoted. It, for me, that, that uh, motivational element that happened because the results of your efforts are so clear, in many ways, so much more clear than they are when you're in school, just kept me going. Um, I also found a way to use my, you know, my litigator skills and always have over the last 30 years. But the part about staying with one company is, in fact, amazing and not what a lot of 20 year olds or people in their 20s think about as their their career paths. What happened with me is I got to have numerous careers within the same company. When you work for a large company, there is a chief marketing officer. I was the chief marketing officer for four years. There is corporate and investment banking and client service. I co-headed that organization for years. Um, there, there is technology and operations, and I've done that for the last 10 years. So if you really think about it, um, I've had multiple careers within the same company. And I've always, I've never hesitated actually to think about doing something new, even if it was lateral or in a couple of cases, moving down in hierarchy. You know, at one time I went from managing 700 people at one hierarchy, reporting to the CEO to reporting one level down, but managing 7,000 people. And so, you know, I've never been one of these people that's hell bent on single ladder, single way up. I've done different things around the firm and made progress that way. And Throughout your time at Bank of America, you've actually been around numerous positions. So you've kind of seen a little bit of everything and you've kind of led, you know, every major line that Bank of America has. What would you say this has really done for you? Well, there isn't anything that I faced that's either an opportunity or a challenge where that broad based experience doesn't come into play. So if I'm thinking about how to operate a complicated platform that serves customers today, it really helps me a lot to understand reputational risk, which is the purview of the things I learned very deeply as chief marketing officer. Or when I'm developing or my teams are developing solutions uh, for customers and clients, it really helps that I know the business. 
because I know what has to happen. I know the standard of excellence. I know customer expectations. And I know how lines of business and, and customer facing people work. I know that feeling of, on, of the only thing mattering being getting the client job done. And, and, and so when I set standards for how we work in technology, that knowledge is invaluable. Um, when I was a lender, I did time in our did time. <laughs> I did time in our special assets group, which was the area of the company um, that serviced distressed or problem loans. And that experience was incredibly valuable. I know what can go right in a scenario and I know what can go wrong. And so even today when I work with vendors, a vendor will say, well, you don't need to put that in the contract. And I say, oh, yes, I do. That contract or that loan agreement is everything. And how do I know that? From my time in SAG. Love that. Um, so Kathy, looking at your career as a whole, um, you're the definition of start from the bottom, uh, work your way up, um, you know, get your hands in multiple different positions um, and make your mark. So we're really, really impressed with all you've been able to build throughout your very amazing professional career. Um, through looking at a few different publications, uh, AmericanBanker.com, for example, has given you the title of most powerful woman in banking. But again, that didn't just start yesterday. Uh, this is all work that you've put in um, to build the reputation that you have today, where you oversee 95,000 employees uh, between 35 different countries and have a budget of $14 billion. So for someone just starting out in finance, in banking, uh, someone that looks up to you as a symbol, as someone who put in the hard work, what advice would you give to that young student? First of all, I think it's really important to remember that what you see in all those articles or in all those news releases isn't really the whole story. Uh, a lot of times I find that young people look at people in positions like mine and can't picture themselves in those positions. That's the first thing I would say. Um, every step you take in your career positions you for the next level and prepares you for the next level. And if what you want to do is be me, you can be me. No question about it. And I do believe that you have to believe in order to accomplish your objectives. Um, you know, I'm in my jeans right now and my Ugg slippers, just like everyone else out there working from home in the world. And most, if you read, if all you do is read articles about me, like some people do, not you guys, but like some people do, you might never think I, you might think I never own slippers or I wouldn't own a pair of jeans. And so people in positions of importance are really people too. And I think that's important. Uh, the other thing I would say is you've gotta be a constant learner in order to get that broad perspective. Uh, learning doesn't stop once you get out of school. Learning starts once you get out of school. And I think having a really aggressive intellectual curiosity, a desire to really not just learn facts, but understand the context and understand what's going on, that's what really creates the kind of um, robust capabilities that allow somebody to move up through the company. So I can't tell you enough how much I, I believe in um, the power of being intellectually aggressive as a learner. Um, the other thing I think is important is authenticity. I think that people who are best as they move up through companies are people who are direct, who are honest and straightforward, who understand that bad news should never wait. Bad news does not get better with time and that um, that that whole notion of being authentic, not necessarily always being um, you know, out there, not necessarily always wearing a baseball cap, um, but being who you are and letting that come through is, will make you better at what you do, more comfortable in the various roles you will take on. And it is the, the most fundamental ingredient to building trust. And I will say this, People only promote people they trust. Every one of my eight direct reports, I literally trust with my professional life every single day. And choosing and developing and relying on those people is the most important work that any executive does. And so really being able to build trust uh, is incredibly important to, to a career journey and starts with authenticity.
love that. That's a very, very important skill uh, to have that trust. Uh, you know, my dad's been saying that for my entire life, the truth will set you free. Sometimes, you know, the truth can be difficult, but, um, you know, you need to be transparent with people. I mean, that's how you build real relationships. Um, and that's going to follow you throughout your entire career. So thank you so much for touching on that. It's so true. And for people in business, sometimes they don't make the leap to understand what the truth will set you free. A phrase I use to myself all the time. Uh, and the way I say it in my own head is facts will set you free. We are accountable as people and as business people or in any field, we're accountable for making judgments from facts. You know, the facts don't tell you what to do, but facts will set you free. Kind of going back a little bit, Kathy, we just wanted to know how your career has developed over time at Bank of America. My career progression is like a lot of others. You start out as a pure doer, right? I started out on the credit training floor with people who wanted to be corporate and investment bankers, a hundred of us the year that I started, all sitting on one floor. Um, so anybody that tells me that open seating in the office place is a new concept, I know to be not really telling the truth. Uh, and what we and we did the work. We didn't manage any other work. We didn't manage other people. We were a hundred percent doers. And as a career develops, there you know, that that mix between doing and managing or doing and leading changes. Um, today, there are a few things that I actually do myself, but in many ways, anything I do myself is something that is not being used to develop the people around me or is time where what I should be doing is doing strategic work, solving problems, um, looking forward, you know, um, monitoring and, and holding people accountable for what they're supposed to do. So that balance um, does change over time. And that's very uncomfortable for some people. In fact, at some point in that journey, our head of human resources sat me down and I will never forget this. He said, Kathy, you are gonna have to figure out that at some point you are not recognized and rewarded for what you do you're recognized and rewarded for leading and managing the work that gets done. Now, it doesn't mean that bosses, managers, leaders can be bubbleheads about the, the work at hand. I have a deep knowledge of what goes on in my organization. I have always prided myself in every role that I've been in on having a really deep knowledge of, of the external environment, the internal environment, the outcomes, all of those kinds of things. Uh, because you can't really manage or lead with credibility without deep knowledge. But I, but I really have to stop and think every time I'm doing something on my own, because leveraging me as a person or as an executive is much more important to the firm. And that only happens when I can cause people to do things, motivate people to do things, lead people to do things. So Kathy, looking at students um, and young professionals looking to get into the industry of banking, um, maybe graduating during a pandemic, uh, very stressed out about, okay, like what more skills do I need? Do I need to take any more classes? Um, typically, you know, for you and your team, uh, what do you guys look for uh, when hiring new students? Um, and what are some maybe soft skills or hard skills uh, that students should take advantage of and pick up on uh, when trying to get, in, uh, get into the industry of banking? You know, sometimes I think financial services has it all wrong. I know my son is a junior at Chapel Hill. Um, my daughter's graduated from William and Mary. So I know the 20s <laughs> and I'm living the 20s. Um, and for most of this year, um, the 20s lived with me. <laughs> uh, so, which I loved by the way. So I think about it um, this way. So I think financial services sometimes gets it wrong because if you aren't figuring out where you want to intern by freshman year or sophomore year, you're going to be behind that cycle. And, and most times um, financial services entities, consulting firms, a lot of the places where students want to work make their decisions actually the summer between junior and senior year, not post-graduation. And so making sure that, and I don't actually think that's right. I don't like it that we force people to make decisions and to, and to go almost um, singularly focused into a series of multiple year internships in order to secure the job that, 
that people want. I know um, one college sophomore who is going to be inter- or is going to be interning this summer with one of the big five, big four, depending on who you talk to, uh, consulting firms. And he said he had multiple choices. And he said, you know, Kathy, it uh, this is really important because the firm I choose this year is probably my, going to end up being my permanent choice. So I, I hate that part of it. Nonetheless, being focused and playing that part of it through is what it takes right now to succeed. I think that people should also lighten up a little bit on the challenges of students, particularly should lighten up a little bit on the challenges of the pandemic. No one expects your internship pattern to be clear. No one expects that. Um, You know, uh, many, my son's internship this summer was shortened to two weeks. And it was you know, a series of executive interviews basically for two weeks. So I, anybody who's hiring knows that that's not building skills. And therefore, in many ways, 2020 is a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a freebie in terms of what students should want to do. So I, and I hope that that disruption of the standard cycle is something that we learn from. And, and used to change the way that we hire people over time. Now your question really related to skills and hard skills, um, technical skills and soft skills. Uh, what I look for in a candidate is, are some of the things I've already talked about. I look for a high energy learner. I look for someone who prides themselves on being the go-to person the per- and the person who knows how to um, see obstacles, but get around them or over them with creativity, great analytics, and great drive. Um, I look for for someone who has a track record of success, even in adversity. And I'm a big believer that we're not um, we're not successful as people or business people in spite of our setbacks. We're we're successful because of our setbacks. So I, I spend a lot of time always talking to people about. Tell me some setbacks. Tell me what you've learned from your your setbacks. How will what you do uh, be different in the future as a result of that? So I look for that. I call that resilience. I look for resilience, aggressive learning, um, high energy, go to get the job done and never met an obstacle. All of those are soft skills. Hard people call them soft. They're the most important skills, Mm -hmm. frankly. Um, uh, You can teach somebody how to code you can teach somebody how to do a spreadsheet. You can teach someone how to do a financial analysis. You can even teach someone how to value closely held companies, right? But you can't teach the other skills. They have to be learned, developed, practiced, and, and, and they have to um, uh, be part of a very well-rounded experience. So I think most um, young people would be surprised at how important uh, the how of what they what they have accomplished is much more so than the, you know, can you code in C++. Thank you for touching on those skills, Kathy. And also thank you for touching on the turbulence of 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, since Michael and I just graduated from college, we've seen it firsthand. You know, a lot of our peers and classmates, you know, their internships were canceled, um, you know, yeah. their grad jobs didn't pan out as they should have. Um, everybody's really, really stressed out. I think as a whole, um, everybody needs to recognize we're all in this together. We're all experiencing, um, you know, the pandemic together. Uh, this is all very, very new, uh, something that we've all had to adjust with um, and grow from. Uh, but it is good to know that, you know, professionals at, you know, different companies and a lot of the people we've spoken with, including yourself, um, are very understanding of the current circumstances. If I could, if I could do anything, I would tone down the stress factor of the surreal elements of 2020. Uh, Assuming you've stayed well, or if you've been sick, you have gotten well, and hoping for that, um, recognizing the terrible uh, nature of this health crisis. Uh, If you've done that, and if you have done something useful and productive and and advancing, self-advancing with your time, employers understand that. I'm more, I actually, I'm more interested in what did you do with your summer? Not, um, did, did your internship pan out or did your job pan out the way um, that, that you thought people who take the setback of COVID and can be resilient through it and can be creative, 
that to me is a very, very um, uh, important indicator of what kind of employee someone, someone should be. But look, I know the stress out factor. I would just, if I could ma- wave a magic wand, I would say, lighten up everybody on your stress factor because the world gets it. The world really does get it. Exactly. And I think a few young people are starting to realize that. And, uh, you know, hopefully things get back to normal or at least a sense of normalcy. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we see some normalcy this year. I hope so. Yes. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I know, um, you know, for a lot of the interview, we focused on financial services, but as someone personally who isn't in financial services, I can confidently say this interview is for everybody. Uh, Just hearing about your professional journey, hearing about the skills that you believe people should have in the workplace when it comes to transparency, honesty, uh, focusing on building relationships, taking risks, uh, doing something out of your comfort zone. These are all really, really important things uh, that we people in their 20s to know about. Um, it really makes us feel special because it really shows that uh, what we're doing uh, is really meaning something special. So thank you so much. Well, two other quick pieces of advice. Of course. One is um, being authentic means having a little fun. Yes. Today, today, the day we're taping is World Cancer Day, hence the pink. And as I, as you know, I'm cheering for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, hence uh, the bucks on on my hat. Uh, I am well known in the company for wearing jerseys on the Friday before game day of whatever team I'm cheering for. I just think it's important to be human and have a little fun with what you do. And the second thing is I wanted to pick up on something I know Beto O'Rourke told all of you when he was with you, which is the whole idea that risk is easier when you're younger. And so to take risks when you're in your 20s. I would frame that up a little bit differently. I would say adventure is younger, or I mean, it's easier when you're younger. So be adventurous. Be adventurous in your learning. Be adventurous in the things you try. Be be intellectually adventurous in your in your learning. I'm not a big risk taker myself, so I can never, you know, get get I can never get my head around take more risk. I wouldn't know how to do that. But I have learned how to cycle. Never done it before. That is adventure. And and so I I think the 20s are the perfect time to be physically, intellectually, and emotionally adventurous. And I just hope you all go for it. Kathy, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Michael, did you have any additional questions for Kathy? No, Kathy, I'm just so glad you were here today. And thank you so much for coming on. Uh, We really enjoyed having you and hope that the rest of your day is great. Um, I loved being here. As soon as I heard the concept, I said, I've got to do it. And I don't know very many people in their 20s who could do what, what, you, what you guys are doing. And to do it so professionally, I just, uh, you're, you're definitely rocking at what you're doing here. And I'm so excited to be a part of it. Thank you, Kathy. From the bottom of our Thank heart, you. thank you so much. That means a lot. Take care. Kathy, it was a pleasure. Thank you.